So hello and welcome to the Open Education Network Summit. My name is Tanya Groves and I'm the Director of Educational Programs for the Open Ed Network. If you're not familiar with the OEN, we are a community of higher ed organizations working together to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open education. Before we begin, the OEN is housed at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, which is located on traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of indigenous people. The university resides on Dakota land ceded in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. We acknowledge this place has a complex and layered history. This land acknowledgement is one of the ways in which we work to educate the campus and community about this land and our relationships with it and each other. We are committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian nations and peoples. Please feel free to acknowledge the indigenous people to whom the land you are situated on belongs in the chat if you feel so inclined. I'll now be handling this session, handing this session off to Carla Myers from Miami University. Carla is a member of the Summit Planning Committee and she will introduce the session and monitor the chat. Hi everybody, thank you so much for being here today. So next, our presentation will be the Open Pedagogy Project Roadmap, a community resource for planning, implementing, sharing, and sustaining open pedagogy projects. This is presented by Brian McGarry at Penn State University and Christina Ryman Murphy at Penn State Abington. Uh, take it away, Brian and Christina. Hi, everyone. Thank you, and welcome to our talk on the Open Pedagogy Project Roadmap. Um, which is a community resource for planning, implementing, sharing, and sustaining open pedagogy projects. And if you're a tweeter, you can feel free to tweet about it with the hashtag OEP roadmap. Um, so we're here to talk about this roadmap, which um, you can see a sort of our visual image of there. And I am going to link in the chat to our website, which supports it as well. One moment. Thank you, Brian, for sharing that. So the Open Pedagogy Project Roadmap is a module-based framework and workshop, which in insists instructors in planning, finding support for sharing and sustaining open pedagogy projects. And when we say instructors, we've used that word very intentionally. Um, could be faculty, could be librarians, could be instructional designers, anyone who's really involved in um, leading, running, or collaborating a project like this. Um, and so the roadmap is a very practical resource which guides instructors through what we're calling the five S's of open pedagogy projects. Project scope, its support, its students, and thinking about sharing and sustaining it. And it's grounded in an expansive definition of open pedagogy, which draws on the commonalities among the many definitions rather than the distinctions. And Brian's going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. It's also inspired by the socio-technical sustainability roadmap, which comes out of Allison Langmead's team at the University of Pittsburgh and is focused on digital humanities projects, but which really um, inspired us to think about what was unique about that that really could help and guide along open pedagogy projects. And finally, it's informed by our experiences leading OER initiatives and collaborating on open pedagogy projects in higher education. So I'm gonna turn it over to Brian. Okay, thank you, Christina. Um, so one of the things that any of you who have been working in the open ped pedagogy space quickly realize is that nobody really agrees on a common definition for open pedagogy. And so as we were, you know, creating a resource that is about um, helping instructors to plan a, an open pedagogy project, we had to kind of decide, well, what is the sort of common baseline that we're all operating from in order to be able to have this resource be applicable to a lot of folks? Um, so these are just a few examples of definitions. I'm sure there are tons of others that, that, that you may prefer to some of these, but um, what we decided to do was kind of take away what are some of the commonalities that we see from um, some of these different definitions. And so that includes things like, um, you know, having students be creators rather than just consumers of information. Uh, also an experiential learning component, um, challenging classroom hierarchies and inviting students to be part of the, the teaching process. Uh, moving away from single use assignments to situated collaborative renewable kinds of assignments. And then also the, the important factor of uh, 
respecting student agency, um, you know, giving them the decision about whether or not they want to share their work and also um, how their work would be licensed. So we're going to briefly talk about a couple of open pedagogy projects that Christina and I were involved with and sort of how those experiences shaped the development of the open pedagogy project roadmap. And then we will uh, follow that up by talking about the uh, roadmap kind of in more detail. So just to start off, um, this is a project that, that I was involved with at a previous institution at um, Ohio University. And um, this is an open textbook that was created in uh, Dr. Ashwini Ganeshan's uh, Hispanic Linguistics course. And it really developed out of a need to uh, provide a textbook that was written at a more accessible level for her students, um, both in terms of the linguistic uh, content and concepts that were covered in it, but also in terms of uh, the mastery of Spanish language that would be necessary to, to read it. Um, and so this textbook was created over time in a modular fashion. It wasn't all done in like one semester. Um, pieces of it were, were built semester by semester. Um, we had initially collaborated on, on this project um, as part of a, an assignment redesign um, to incorporate, incorporate some elements of the ACRL framework into it. And, um, and so that was, if, if you look on the right side of the screen, you see a snippet of uh, that particular assignment, that study guide assignment that sort of formed the basis for the chapters in this textbook. Um, and like I said, over time, additional assignments were brought in to kind of flesh things out further and add new components to the textbook. Um, in addition to the students who were adding content as members of the class, um, there were also some students that were hired outside of class to uh, be editors and develop some additional content. If you're interested in learning more about this particular project, you can read about it. Uh, the link on the right there um, from the Open Pedagogy Approaches book, um, there's a chapter on it. So just some of the lessons that, that came away from this project that kind of helped to inform the Open Pedagogy Project Roadmap. One is that this is very much a nonlinear process. Um, as I said, different pieces of it were built over time in a modular kind of fashion. And, and so um, even once you finish those pieces, you might decide that there's something that's missing here and you have to go back and add new assignments to kind of fill that out a bit. Um, another aspect, which I think kind of ties in with the, the previous presentation about um, you know, students having uh, concerns about, about this kind of work. It's, it's very new for them in a lot of cases. And so one thing that helps to alleviate some of that is uh, changing up the, the way that you grade the work. And so um, for this particular course, it was done on a, a credit, no credit basis um, using specifications grading. And, and so that's kind of tying it to the learning outcomes and then also offering students an opportunity to revise their work. And not only does that help in terms of kind of lowering the stakes for students and, and making them feel a little bit more comfortable, but it, all, it also helps in terms of developing the, the sort of final product, if you will, because if you give students the opportunity to revise things, then that's kind of less work that you have to do on the back end to um, kind of bring it up to a publishable uh, sort of level. Um, Another key component here was student agency. So giving students the opportunity to opt out if they wanted to and doing so in a way that there would be sort of no undue influence on them in terms of worrying about whether or not they would get a good grade. Um, also, as I said on the previous slide, um, having students have some agency over the choice of license. And so for this assignment, um, the students were allowed to choose the license as, as a class. And we made sure that it was an informed choice by having me go in and do a workshop with them, teaching them about uh, copyright and Creative Commons licenses. Um, also an important thing that came out of this was considering upfront um, any kinds of 
social justice goals that you might have as part of the assignment um, and really intentionally building that into it. Um, although there were a number of instances where students sort of organically brought up the, these uh, topics themselves. And then finally, as I mentioned, there were some students who were hired outside of the course to uh, contribute to the book. And this was really students who had uh, specialized knowledge or skills specifically with this, uh, having, having greater um, mastery of Spanish language and with uh, linguistics concepts. And I'll turn it over to Christina. And the long-term open pedagogy project I'm embedded in just started and was piloted this past semester in an undergraduate English literature course taught by Dr. Marissa Nicosia, a professor of Renaissance literature at Penn State Abington. And we worked together to redesign the course to take advantage of pre and early modern literature that is of course all in the public domain to involve students in the development of the materials and to include diverse voices and perspectives. And we were inspired by Robin DeRosa's open anthology of earlier American literature. So we used all OER anthologies or open digital scholarly editions for the course's text. And after a very traditional 10 week seminar style class, we switched over to a final editorial project, which asked students to remix, annotate, gloss, and contextualize a course reading of their choice by researching and authoring and ultimately writing an introductory header, four footnotes, and finding two images for, if they consented, inclusion in a future open access textbook on transatlantic pre-modern literature. You can see here a little bit about the assignment and one of the students who wrote a footnote for Hester Poulter's poem and one of the images that she researched to go along with it. Next slide, please. Overall, it was a very rewarding projects, uh, project. In terms of challenges, we realized we needed to do more signposting throughout the course as students really had a lot of questions about what they were actually going to be doing. Um, even though we pointed out exam pointed two examples, students initially were really stuck on format or rubric and not clear about writing for the public as opposed to a traditional final essay. That did create some anxiety or discomfort. Thank you all for your presentation right before us. Absolutely, that spoke to so much of what we experienced with the students. And we were very conscious of and empathetic towards them. And on the fly, we're adding in additional consultation time, um, additional peer review as well to kind of meet those needs and address some of that discomfort and anxiety. Many students were very excited about the project though as well. They were curious, they were enthusiastic. And overall in their presentations and final reflection essays, some things became clear about the student impact of doing an open pedagogy project. Sources were really important, which as a librarian, we always love to see that. Um, but students also expressed a lot of personal connections to the text and the project and writing for an authentic audience really resonated with students. And so based on Brian and our collective experiences being closely embedded on these projects and with supporting other respective OER programs, we developed the roadmap. Um, which we're going to talk a little bit about more now. Um, the first section of the roadmap asks instructors to think about the scope of their project. Um, and when we say scope, we're asking instructors to begin by defining their values and their goals, actually, before scoping the actual project. Um, we want them to think about the why, why they're doing this, why they want to do this, um, before they think about the what. Um, and so the roadmap is designed to um, Ideally, you would do it kind of before you began an open pedagogy project, but you could absolutely do it in the middle of, um, of one you're already in if you haven't had the chance to think about these things. Um, it's some of the things that you will absolutely have to address, but which you may not be able to set, a time, set aside the time to do. And so that's what the roadmap is about, giving you the space to think about these things and define them um, and explore them. And so um, as part of values and goals, we also ask anybody using the roadmap to think about how their project can center diversity, equity, and inclusion. One of the hallmarks of open education is that it prioritizes access um, because open pedagogy centers access, but in a way that prioritizes student access to participatory knowledge creation. Um, those values and goals become really important in thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion is central. Because when we invite students to bring the whole of themselves to creating or modifying course content, course content will inevitably be changed to reflect the, the diversity and complexity of student identities. Um, once we've scoped, uh, asked people to scope their values, we then ask them to think about their capacity. And capacity includes both time, 
collaborators, and thinking of ways to maximize that capacity by looking at what might already be available, which is, of course, another wonderful, wonderful part of open education, that things are licensed to be used. Um, and then finally, once instructors have thought through their values and goals, we ask them to think about the project, the what of the project. And so once um, instructors have worked through this section, the scope of the project, then we ask them to think about what kind of support they might have for their project. Um, and generally, although um, being a faculty instructor or leading any kind of um, course. Okay. Um, new puppy who's <laughs> taking the toddler's toys. Um, um, I'll have to add my picture to the, the puppy channel when I get it on Slack. So anyway, once um, uh, support, support is really important, right? Um, in being a faculty member or instructing can be a very solitary endeavor, but open pedagogy, because you have invited literally students into the process, it inevitably becomes collaborative um, and involves a lot of different things. It may be very different from what you're used to doing. And so we really ask um, people using the roadmap, but we've designed it to really think about the various levels of support that might be needed to do a project like this. And those include structural and systemic support, looking at your strategic plan, thinking about administrative support, possibly funding, um, disciplinary support, looking to various open education groups or statewide groups to find out what kind of support there is for this open pedagogy work. And then um, we guide people think through thinking through logistical support. Are there librarians, instructional designers, technical folks? Um, is there an accessibility coordinator or a disability resources office to work with who can support the project? And finally, because really there's not a, I, I don't know if you could find an open pedagogy project that doesn't in some way involve technology, um, technological support. But, but thinking about what technology support a project, an open pedagogy project, and that could be anything from Wiki EDU, Google Drive, Pressbooks, um, even email, right? Um, thinking about how long they're funded, whether students will need training on them, are they accessible, and is there a backup site, right? When students are doing all this work, you want to make sure that it doesn't get lost at some point in a system switch over to a new product or who knows in some kind of like outage right um so we ask faculty to think through or i'm sorry instructors to think through all of these pieces as they're thinking about how their project can be best supported so after thinking about some of those kinds of higher level sorts of things the the next uh section of the roadmap kind of brings it down uh back to the students and so thinking about, um, you know, refining the con uh, your content and your process to really be focused on students. Um, this is an opportunity to move beyond just content mastery and be thinking about um, developing like content agnostic uh, practices. And so um, this section really encourages you, encourages you to uh, make your learning outcomes less focused on just the content, but uh, more so about the process. Um, so the, the, the first module of this section, um, you know, gets at that idea of decentering content and also thinking about how are students actually going to be participating in this project and uh, thinking about assessment of the project. Uh, so, so I mentioned previously you know, trying to do grading in a way that um, lessens some of the discomfort that, that students have. And, but we also recognize that some folks are in a situation where they don't have a lot of agency over the, the grading method that is used for their course. You know, you, you might be in a situation where everybody who teaches a section of that particular course has to do it in the same way. Um, so with that being said, we, still point to opportunities to bring in some of these aspects um, that that would be relevant to open pedagogy. So thinking about um, opportunities for peer review and what we mean by peer review is not um, like uh, with you know scholarly publications or anything like that. What we're talking about is having students uh, review one another's work and learn from each other. Um, also, as I had mentioned, the, the aspect of having opportunities for revision, again, give students the ability to um, make their work better and to not feel as hung up on the grade. Um, 
also having opportunities for students to to reflect you know so maybe maybe you're in a situation where you have to have certain assignments and a certain grading scheme for, for the course but you could perhaps build in an assignment where students just reflect on their experience and that's an opportunity to to um, offer a grade related to open work um, sort of shifting gears the, to the aspect of agency and any kinds of ethical concerns that come up. Um, you know, it's really important to define upfront who the public is that you're going to be sharing this work with and making sure that students are aware of that from the start. Um, related to this is the idea of students having the ability to opt in or opt out of the process. Um, and also making sure that you document that in a way that, um, again, isn't going to put any undue pressure on students to either share or not share their work. So then the, the final uh, section of the roadmap is really about thinking how, how you'll share the work and then how it will be sustained. Um, and also, this is the part of the, the roadmap that asks you to reflect on everything that you've done in the previous sections of the roadmap and kind of look for the gaps and determine what your next steps are going to be. So, you know, thinking about sharing your work, um, there's sort of two pieces of that, that that we point to. One is being how you're going to communicate about your work to whatever audiences um, are of interest to you. So. You know, your audiences may differ depending on what your motives are. So, you know, are you trying to make other educators aware of this awesome resource that you created? Or are you trying to raise your profile within your disciplinary community? Um, are you trying to justify this work to administrators at your institution? Are you trying to leverage this in your promotion and tenure? Or maybe if you're, you know, on, on the job market, um, how are you going to leverage that work in, in that process as well? Um, so thinking about all of that, that work up front so that you can then decide how you're going to frame the work that you're doing for those different audiences. Um, also thinking about where you're going to share the, the final product. Um, so is that you know on some sort of personal website? Is that an institutional repository? A disciplinary repository or an OER sort of content um, agnostic kind of uh, repository. And then thinking ahead about how you're going to sustain this work after you've, you know, put this together. Um, so first of all, thinking about any kinds of uh, problems that, that might come up as far as um, sustaining the work over time. So for instance, if this is a, pro is a project that maybe relies on some sort of funding or some sort of access to technology, are you going to have access to that over the long term to be able to complete the project and also to be able to uh, make any kinds of updates or modifications that you need to in the future? Um, and then, as, as I mentioned, this uh, section of the roadmap kind of ties it all back together with the previous sections to be thinking about, okay, what are the gaps that are in uh, the work that I've done up to this point? So that really helps you to identify what your next steps are. So if there are uh, connections that you need to make, or there's more information that you need, or you need to investigate uh, what kinds of resources, te technology, and so forth are available to you, that can uh, give you some direction for your next steps. And usually we run this as like a workshop. And so one thing that we like to do is to conclude by getting people to think about what their next steps are going to be. And I think we've probably all been in, in a situation before where um, you, know, you go to a conference, you go to a workshop, something like that, and you get all these great ideas and then you go back to work and then work happens. <laughs> and so all, all of these great ideas kind of fall by the wayside because work just gets in the way. So what we like to do when we run this as a workshop is to conclude by having people kind of map out what their next steps are going to be. And that could be, you know, immediately after the workshop, it could be a week from now, a month from now, and so forth. 
because then if you're intentionally thinking about those up front, it becomes, you know, a little less easy, I guess, to, to have that sort of fall by the wayside. At this point, you know, we'd like to open it up for questions. If folks don't have any questions, we have a few questions for you all. Um, you know, we're, we're curious to, to hear, you know, how you might adapt this for your own context. Um, so as Christina mentioned at the, st at the start, um, we developed this to be kind of uh, discipline agnostic, but we've run it in some context where it was with a particular disciplinary audience. So maybe that's, you know, a concern. Um, another thing that we're curious about is just some of the, some of the challenges that you all might have uh, faced in open pedagogy projects. And then if there are any resources that you think we should add to it, and we will definitely be adding uh, the handout from the, the first presenters in, in the session, because it looks like it would fit very well with this topic. So, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Um, so we don't have any questions posted in the question and answer, although there is a very robust discussion going on about both presentations in the chat. Um, so Brian, we'll need a minute or two to wrap up, but if you want to share one of your questions with the group, I think we have a little bit of time for discussion. Can we just unmute to discuss, or do you want us to put it in the chat? Feel free to unmute. OK, OK. Well, I was just going to say, the other thing that strikes me about your roadmap um, is that even in institutions that might not have a robust um, open pedagogy uh, area or, or office, <laughs> Um, that instructors could use it themselves. I mean, I think it's really well, like you could guide yourself through a lot of those questions. I think it's really useful. Thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate that you mentioned that it's nonlinear too. I, I often find that to be the case, like, oh, you might, educate about Creative Commons licenses at the beginning and then loop around at the end just to make sure everyone's okay, you know, with the, the choices that were made, so. Yeah, there's, there's so many things that just kind of come up unexpectedly along the way and you have to really be kind of flexible to be able to, you know, go back and um, recalibrate as necessary. Cheryl, I saw Cheryl posted in the chat about um, templates for student opt-in and opt-out would be helpful. So in section three under students, we do have a link to University of Washington has a template for students opting in and out. Um, and we are working on sharing the one that we've used as well. So thanks for that, Cheryl. That's a great question. It's come up frequently. So. Thank you to the folks at the University of Washington who shared that. <laughs> so, we don't know them. We just found it. We're like, oh, this is really helpful. So. We have about two minutes, two and a tiny bit more minutes left in the presentation. Um, if anybody wants to share one last comment or piece of feedback or experience, um, and then uh, we can wrap up. Happy to read out the question that came into the Q&A panel and see if anyone wants to answer it. Um, somebody says, one of the challenges I've had is when approached by a faculty member who's interested in a student publishing or authoring project without thinking of it as an open publication in these instances, I have to do some convincing around the value of openness and the importance of incorporating student agency and choice around licensing, how they are named, et cetera how to balance faculty goals around a work being a sort of showcase object for their teaching promotion and making sure student agency is built into the assignment. If, if anyone wants to take for two minutes, I think it's such a good question.
I'm wondering, Liz, and maybe Michaela, as you started to work on the textbook project, was that a part of your conversation at all? Or did Liz come in saying, I know I want it to be an open project and I want students to be um, empowered in deciding how this work is represented? I'm going to give Liz first shot at answering that. We don't have tenure and promotion, but I mean, certainly the questions of standard academic practice versus student voice came up. Yeah, and I'll say I, I went into it, you know, not knowing a lot about open education. I, I mostly saw the value in it being free. Um, so yes, but I was ready. I did want to do it. And of course, now I've learned so much more about how it's not just that it's free, it's that others you know, can take it and use it and adapt it and can be really used so widely and make um, learning so much more equitable. We had a couple articles, at least one of which was, was recommended by our writing center director. Um, and it was about, Liz, do you, can you off the top of your head rattle off those two articles about standard English versus inclusive practices? Yeah, one is um, Taming, I think it's called Taming the Wild Tongue by Gloria and Delugia. I'm not, I'm just saying this from memory, I'm not looking at her name. And the other is Vershanti Young's um, something like, do writers have to use their own English around that? And both of those were really helpful to students in terms of thinking about speaking in their own voices and that maybe academic writing isn't, you know, the end goal for everybody or for every project that wants to be equitable. Well, we are at four o'clock. Um, so first off, I wanna say thank you so much to our fabulous presenters. We had Amy, Sylvia, Liz, Lori, Michaela, Brian, and Christina. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us today. To our audience, thank you so much for joining us. We want to remind you that today's webinar has been recorded and will be shared in the coming weeks. Um, you can su subscribe to the OEN's YouTube playlist to receive a notification, and I will put that link in the chat real quick. Slides and transcripts will also be linked. You can keep the fabulous conversation around these great presentations going via Slack. Um, we'll share that uh, link in the chat as well. And if you are an OEM member, we hope you will also contribute to the conversation in the OEM Google group. And thank you again today for these fabulous presentations and our presenters sharing their knowledge and to the audience for being here for your great discussion and great questions.